This is our movie for Christmas. What's the movie on Christmas? One day Mary was in her house and she wears a long sparkly pink dress. Mary was sleeping the floors. No, Mary washing dishes. An angel appeared to her. Oh look, an angel. Don't be afraid. God is going to God has give, have given you a baby. His name will be Jesus. Does that mean my belly is going to get big? Oh, yeah. The daddy's name is Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. He built things out of wood. Joseph built a big ship. He used a hammer and a nail and a saw. Wrenches. Wrenches. What about Joseph? I have a surprise for you. I'm pregnant and we're gonna have a baby. There's this angel that came down and told me. That's impossible. We're not married yet. It's true. I believe you. The angel came to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. Her baby is in, uh, her baby is from God. His name is Jesus. He will save his people. They were gonna get married and he took them to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem with a donkey. <laughs> I think, I think the donkey had wings. He fly with his ears. It takes him very long to get to Bethlehem. Two miles away like 15 or 100 in a million. They went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's a long time. I couldn't even say it. They got to Bethlehem. I wonder what it, where, where we're going to stay. Yeah, me too. Um, we're having a baby, and we need a, um, hotel room fast because we're going to have it very, very fastly, and it's going to come very, um, fast. No, you cannot get in. No, you cannot get in my house. No, no, no. Where should we go? Uh, oh, uh, a staple. That's, that's good. Let's go down there. Yeah. They had the baby in a staple. It was a really little barn. It stinks in here. Yuck. They swept the floor and they sprayed it air freshener. There are lots of animals around. Chicken, some chickens. There's more animals, but the only thing I think about is chickens. And they were really loud. Like cows and stuff. <sighs> I'm so hungry. I wish I could eat a big old cow with milk for it is tummy. Joseph, I think it's time to have a baby. Don't be afraid, Mary. They had their baby. They put him in in the manger, and then they put cloth over him. I love you. I love you so much. You're the best food, Jesus. Baby Jesus, I love you. So there were shepherds in the fields who were watching their flocks by night. Bah, bah, bah. Um. 
Have you seen the movie Star Wars? Why? I mean, there's actually this Star Wars Lego that I want for Christmas, but but I like got it on Wednesday because because I ordered it online. But it's not Christmas. A heavenly host appeared to them, and they were terrified. <laughs> Have you seen the movie Star Wars? Gordon and the Gun and Highest. Today was safer and boring. You'll find him in a manger, laughed and croft. Go and see him. Let's go to Bethlehem. Having snacks. Marshmallow. They walked eh, to the three wise men were sitting on a deck of a high house. One weird yellow and one weird blue and the other one weird purple. And they saw a very big, large star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Uh, that light is too bright. They followed the star and they followed it to Bethlehem to see and they, saw, they found baby Jesus. And then back in the barn. Jesus loves me, this I know. But the Bible tells me so. This I wake to is drunk. Yes, Jesus loves me. You know what? When we were on our way in, we saw this little kitty. It was black. Yeah, her name is Sarah. We're happy that you're finally here, and we've been waiting for an hour and 15 minutes. Have you seen the movie Star Wars? Where is the baby? We have come to find him and worship him. They gave him three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and word. What is frankincense? Stinky. Mom, the baby's so cute. Thanks. He's a special baby. Baby Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was God's son. Jesus came because we needed him. God sent him down to die for our sins. It's important to worship him every day, even when it's not Christmas. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. I'm gonna pull this microphone no. right here. Uh, it's good where it is, but it's right there. It's meant to be inside. Yeah. to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep no Merry Christmas from the Davises. Merry Christmas from the McCrory family. Merry Christmas from the Schulichs. From the Hood family to you, we would like to wish you a, a very, very Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas from the Watson family. I'm Andy Hill, Executive Pastor at Moberly. And from my family and the Moberly staff family, we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. We hope you enjoy tonight's Christmas Eve service. Merry Christmas.
Hi, I'm Will Hagel, and I want to welcome you to Marbley's Candlelight Christmas Eve service. We miss seeing everyone in person this year, but we really think you're going to enjoy this online worship experience. If you're a guest, we're glad to have you. If you've been a guest for a while and are ready to take the next step, or if you'd like to make a spiritual decision like salvation or baptism, you can go to marbley.org slash next card. Over the last several days, we've been passing out Christmas Eve bags. Inside, you'll find some candles. Make sure to have those ready at the end of the service. If you didn't get a bag, maybe just find some candles around the house. Christmas Day is almost here, the day our Savior was born. God humbled himself and became a human so that he could redeem us. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for everything that you've given us. Thank you for this gift of life. Thank you for friends, family. And God, thank you for coming for us. And thank you for the hope that we have in you. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
joy to the world. gospel, John tells us about the coming of Jesus. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us.
kids. Hope you're having a wonderful Christmas Eve with your family and your friends. My name is Miss Suzanne, and I'm here to read you a very special Christmas story. It's special because God helped me write it just for you. It's called The Christmas Manger. And while I'm reading it to you tonight, I want you to listen and see if you can figure out the answer to a question. Here it is. What happens to the manger that makes the manger change? What happens to the manger that makes him change? If you're ready to try to figure that out, I'm ready to read A Christmas Manger to you. So turn on your Christmas lights, grab your hot chocolate, snuggle up to someone you love, and let's read. Long, long ago in a land far away stood a small wooden manger holding one piece of hay. It belonged to a stable, but had been pushed to the side for a bigger, newer manger that had been built with great pride. The small manger felt sad it wasn't needed anymore, so it drooped and it sagged and its heart was forlorn. The manger could remember when it had been new and the innkeeper had been very proud of it too. But for now, it sat alone and away from the friends it had nourished at the start of each day. In a dark, quiet corner, unused and alone, the once proud manger became a small mouse's home. Before long, the manger's heart became empty and sad. It felt bitter and hurt and lonely and mad. Time went by and the small manger knew that its usefulness was over and the happy days were through. But then something happened. What do you think happened? Let's find out. One lonely starry night, the manger could hear a beautiful song through the night sky so clear. This music was different than any it had heard, like the whistles of men working or the chirps of different birds. This music was glorious like angels might sing and sounded as if it were meant for a king. 
Just then, a small donkey poked its head in the door. The innkeeper followed and pointed to the floor. This is all the room I have, the innkeeper said, but the animals are friendly and the hay makes a good bed. On the donkey sat a woman. At her side was a man. He seemed gentle and strong as he gave her his hand. Down from the donkey to a bed made of hay, he said, rest here, Mary, this is where we'll stay. The little manger watched with curious eyes as its ears heard the music and stars filled the skies. Something was happening in the stable in the dark and something was happening in the sad manger's heart. Things there were fluttering and moving within. A seed of joy was growing. It was hoping again. And then, and then, a baby was born. Joseph, said Mary, we need a place for our son, something his size that is sturdy and warm. They looked around the stable, but nothing seemed right. Where was a bed for the child born that night? Now, the manger had heard what the people had said, and it knew that it wanted to be this child's bed. It thought, I have been hiding away for so long, but something inside tells me hiding is wrong. I have a purpose. I know that I do. When the carpenter built me, he said that was true. But I must make some noise so I can be found. So it mustered all its strength and made a small sound. Do you think anyone heard him? Let's find out. Look, Joseph, said Mary, as the manger she spied. That manger is perfect. It's just the right size. Why, I would agree, said the kind gentleman. And Joseph reached for the manger with carpenter's hands. With the use of some tools and some fresh, clean hay, this is the perfect place for Jesus to lay. Soon the manger was ready, and it reached up to hold this blessed child from heaven, the light for our world. Shepherds came in and knelt by his side. They worshiped King Jesus all through the night, then hurried away to tell all those they knew that the promise of God now had come true. The manger felt different as it cradled the child. It felt newer and cleaner and stronger and proud. But this should not surprise us, for we know it is true that once touched by Jesus, all things become new. The end. I hope you enjoyed my story. Do you know the answer to my question? What happened to the manger that caused it to change? If you know, tell me. You got it, that's right. The manger was touched by Jesus. Tonight, I hope you'll talk with your family a little bit more about what it means to be touched by Jesus and made new. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the evening, that it's not too hard for you to go to sleep tonight. And when you wake up in the morning, you have a very Merry Christmas.
Welcome to the marvelly Christmas Eve candle lighting service. And like everything in the year 2020 with COVID, everything seems to be different. But I want to thank all of you for joining us for this Christmas candle lighting service virtually. And I want to thank the marvelly staff and the many volunteers who have to prepare you to have an actual candle lighting time with those that you're with. And as we come to this time on Christmas Eve, I have a feeling a lot of you have been wondering about the gifts you may be receiving. And others of you might be thinking about the gifts that you're giving, hoping that when they're opened in the morning, that they will really excite the person who receives them. As you think about that, let me ask you a question. What are the character traits of the perfect gift? Well, number one, the perfect gift expresses the personality of the giver. You learn something about that person by how they give gifts. But that's not all. The perfect gift involves generosity and sacrifice. It involves some time. It involves some thought to think about that perfect gift. But thirdly, the perfect gift meets a need that we just could not meet for ourselves. Maybe we couldn't afford it or we just didn't know how we would bring it about. And that's what a perfect gift does. It meets a need we can't meet for ourselves. But fourth, the perfect gift brings lasting joy and meaning. I had a family member, a relative, who would often give me a model airplane to build on Christmas. I want you to know, he, even though he thought I would like it, I had absolutely no interest in building model airplanes. And when I would get that gift at Christmas time, I would just throw it in the closet. I wouldn't even open the package. No interest at all. So obviously, that was not the perfect gift. But on the other hand, the fifth quality of the perfect gift is a reminder that when a great gift is given, the recipient of that gift can't help but talk about it with those that they care about. Those of you who are children, you get a great gift tomorrow, you're probably going to want to call your friends or talk to your friends or call a grandparent or call an uncle or aunt or somebody just to talk about that gift. You just can't help but talk about it. Now, keep that theme in mind, the perfect gift, as we think about the wise men. The wise men are really known for two big things. One was a big star, but secondly, because of the gifts they brought. Now, I have a question for you. When that big star appeared in the sky, the wise men from the east that probably were for, from Babylon or Persia, why would they feel like that that star was a sign that there had been the birth of a Jewish king, but not just any Jewish king, but the Messiah. Why would they even think that? You know, it seems to me that it just makes sense that since the prophet Daniel, hundreds of years earlier, served in the palace, in the king's palace, as a great advisor to both Babylonian and Persian kings, that perhaps he had talked within the palace about one day the Jewish people will have a Messiah to come to them to bring them to what God wants them as a people to be, to lead them in a tremendous way. And perhaps that was a part of the Persian and Babylonian courts wondering about that Jewish king. But either way, God spoke through that star. And he got the interest of these wise men who studied the stars, trying to understand their meaning. And when that star seemed to be to the west of them, they wondered if perhaps this was a sign that that great Jewish king had been born. So they followed that star. And they wound up in Jerusalem. They wound up in Herod's palace. Now, these had to be great aristocrats that they could even have access to visiting with Herod. And when they got there, they asked him, they said, well, tell us, tell us about this, this star, this great king that is going to be born and where exactly he would be born. Well, that really worried Herod because he was a paranoid old soul and any threat to his power would really unsettle them and unsettle everybody else. But he didn't know much about the Bible, like a lot of political leaders. And so he called on his religious advisors to come and tell him what the Scripture said. And they said, well, it's obvious. Micah the prophet said our Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem is just about five miles from Jerusalem. So when the wise men heard that, they were excited. They were close. So they continued to follow that star until it was shining over this special place where Jesus and Joseph and Mary were. And look at what God's Word says about that event. Verse 9 of Matthew 2. 
After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Now, obviously, Jesus was not just a baby at this point. He was a young child. So when they appeared in that first Christmas was months, at least months, after Jesus had been born. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, in other words, it wasn't a stable, it wasn't a cave at this point, but Mary and Joseph are staying in a house. There the wise men saw the child, once again the child, with Mary his mother. And they fell to the ground and they worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now look at the wise men. They worshipped Jesus as the Messiah. They were not Jewish. They followed what God had given them in the great star and then trusted the word of God in Scripture. And they wind up coming to this little child that they believed to be the Jewish Messiah. And they worshipped him. They showed tremendous faith. They trusted the Word of God, and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And in so many biblical examples of worship, worship always involves giving to God. And so the wise men set a great example. They brought three gifts to Jesus. One was gold, and gold was symbolic of the birth of a king. One was frankincense, and that was symbolic of the birth of a priest. And what does a priest do? A priest is a mediator. A priest allows for sinful man to be united with a holy God. The priest is the mediator that would offer the sacrifices so sinful men could be forgiven and have a relationship with a holy God. But then the third gift was most unusual for a child, the gift of myrrh. What could that mean? Myrrh was used for the anointing of bodies when people had died. You see, this was a gift of prophecy as to why Jesus was born. He was born to die, to die for your sins and our, all of our sins. And it really helps us to understand the meaning of Christmas. You see, these three gifts show us that they believe Jesus is a king, that Jesus is a priest that reconciles a holy God with sinful man. And it was a prophetic gift that Jesus had come to die as the myrrh was symbolic and used in the anointing of a dead body when it was to be buried. Now I ask you, these are great gifts, but were these the perfect gift? They really were not. They were great gifts. We learn from the wise men about giving to Jesus at Christmas. And recently, many of you gave a birthday gift, a Christmas gift to Jesus by your special gift to the World Missions Offering. But you see here, as great as these gifts were, they were not the perfect gift. You see, the only perfect gift that's ever been given is Jesus. And when we think about the character traits of the perfect gift, we see, first of all, that gift of Jesus expresses the personality of the giver, God the Father. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And what an expression of generosity and sacrifice. A perfect gift always involves generosity and sacrifice on the part of the giver, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the two persons of the triune God, along with the Holy Spirit, express here the generosity and sacrifice of the giver. But think about Jesus too. Jesus meets a need that we cannot meet for ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right with God. We need a Savior to forgive us of our sin. That's exactly what Jesus did. He forgave us of our sin. Now, we don't necessarily receive that gift. Every person has to decide if they're going to receive that gift. But he came so that we can be forgiven of our sin. He came to offer us salvation from sin and death and hell. And we cannot do that for ourselves. It only comes through Jesus. So Jesus is that perfect gift and that he meets a need that we just can't meet for ourselves. But that's not all. The only gift that brings lasting eternal joy is Jesus. Everything else tends to fade away. And also, when a person receives gift, Jesus, 
that person can't help but talk about the joy of coming to know Jesus and receiving salvation and the gift of eternal life. Because the perfect gift causes the recipient of the gift to talk about it with others. So in that light, I hope that as you're giving and receiving gifts on Christmas morning, I hope you'll just take a moment, maybe have a word of prayer individually or a word of prayer with your family and loved ones that you're gathered with, and just thank God for the perfect gift, the only perfect gift that's ever been given, and that is Jesus. And as you give and receive gifts to loved ones, realize the wise men set an example of giving gifts to Jesus, and the wise men show us how good it is to give gifts to others at Christmas time. But only those of us who have received in faith the perfect gift of Jesus understand what that perfect gift is. So this Christmas, take time to thank God the Father for sending us the perfect gift, His Son Jesus. And if you have not received that gift because you lack faith about what the Word of God says about Jesus, what could be a better time than Christmas to receive the perfect gift of Jesus, salvation, forgiveness, eternal life. I promise you, it'll be a Christmas like no other. It'll be the greatest Christmas you ever experience, for you will have received the perfect gift. And as you reflect on that gift, realize Jesus came to be the light of the world in a world filled with darkness and sin. So tonight or this afternoon, as you and those that are with you light those candles, remember Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus has that light of himself shine through us when we have received him, the perfect gift. And Jesus wants us to share this good news of him, the perfect gift, with others. And when we receive that gift ourselves, we can't help but tell others about that gift. So when you light the candle of a friend or a loved one that you're with, remember it's another reminder of what Christmas is all about, of how Jesus, symbolized by that great light, that great star, is the light of the world. And in the process, Jesus being given to us allows all of us to receive the perfect gift and then begin to share with others about the perfect gift as well. Merry Christmas. It is a real privilege to be your interim pastor in this season. And I look forward to seeing you after the Christmas holidays. God bless.